This is Twit. The square in the tower is... It touches on technology topics. There's there's definitely a, a current uh, that, that really is very relatable to all of the important things that are happening right now that are shaping our world founded, uh, you know, uh, the foundation being social media is driving a lot of this stuff. But I know a lot of what you write about in your book is much more historical than that. It, it doesn't just, it doesn't dwell completely in the technological aspects of things, but really gets to the heart of what a network truly is and what makes a network successful and so influential in so many ways. So I thought we'd kind of start there, maybe kind of give a little bit of background. And, you know, and I think the, the obvious starting point is the square and the tower. What is your inspiration for really diving into breaking apart how, how these networks work? Well, I moved from Harvard to Stanford about a year and a half ago, and I'd had this project in my mind for some time. But moving here was a wake up call because it struck me that many people, including quite powerful people uh, working in Silicon Valley, had an almost complete indifference to history, or mm -hmm. they regarded history as having begun with the Google IPO and everything before that was the Stone Age. So I wanted to write a book that would give a history lesson to those tech types who think they have invented the world anew and have nothing to learn from the past. But I also wanted to get my fellow historians to think a little bit more about not just technology, but, but also the social networks that can be built on it. So this is a book that I think your audience will enjoy a lot more than the history books they were made to read at school, which they probably hated, <laughs> because this book takes you on a kind of roller coaster ride through, well, more than 500 years of history. It's sure. pretty much focused on the last 500 years. And it makes some provocative arguments about the relationships between hierarchical structures of power, towers, and social networks, uh, squares, hence the title of the book, The Square and the Tower. And it argues probably a little bit against the grain of your, your viewers that not everything in history is technologically determined. Technology matters a lot, but sometimes uh, the direction of causation is not quite the one that you expect. So I offer a, an alternative historical theory for the origins of Silicon Valley, and I, I offer some arguments about why particular technologies uh, have taken off at, at particular times. I'm not a technological determinist, but I'm a historian who, who takes technology very seriously and wants to make sure the people who work in computer science and in engineering are aware that not everything they invented in, in the last 20 or 30 years is completely new. Yeah, and it's really easy to dwell in that world in the in, in the technological space. We, you know, obviously, uh, we're here in Silicon Valley, and it really seems like the makeup of the area is based now more than ever around technology. So it's easy to dwell inside of that realm and, and feel like this is the first time we've seen these things happen. And of course, you're a historian, you know that, you know, we, we've seen this happen many times in different instances, but it is no doubt a highly technological point in in our existence, right? So so much more now, more than ever, these things are determined in, a, in the technological space. Uh, Eric Schmidt had said that, you know, of course, there's a quote from Eric Schmidt uh, from Google uh, on the back that, that says that this provides that much needed history lesson to Silicon Valley. Why do you think people in Silicon Valley have been so quick to not respect or understand the history that drives what makes these services so successful for them? Well, I think it's very tempting when everything is going fantastically well and businesses are, are booming to assume that it's because uh, you're a genius right. and you've changed the rules, uh, invented something that's fundamentally so new that whatever went before is sort of irrelevant to you. I think a good illustration of, of this uh, problem is that just a couple of years ago, nobody uh, in Silicon Valley had an inkling of the trouble that was brewing in and around the election uh, of 2016. And since I've been here, we've gone from denial in the immediate aftermath of the election, denial that 
the network platforms had played a decisive role, denial that fake, fake news on Facebook had been a significant variable in the election, to acceptance that something pretty bad happened in that election. And it, it certainly wasn't something that, that many people in Silicon Valley wanted to see happen. So I think what Silicon Valley learned in the last couple of years is that no matter how smart you uh, may feel you are, and no matter how innovative your technology may be, uh, political history is going to take an interest in your life at some point, especially if without quite meaning to, you've become, as I think Facebook has become, the biggest content publisher in American history with an enormous share now of the US news market. 45% of Americans get their news from Facebook. Uh, and I don't think anybody set out to turn Facebook into a vast content publisher, but that's what it is. And that means that the algorithm that, that uh, drives the news feed is in some ways the most powerful editor in American history. All of that has major consequences that I think people grossly underestimated uh, just a couple of years ago. And they underestimated the political risk to the big technology companies because they just really weren't thinking historically. Uh, the idea that you could establish quasi-monopolies in so many different sectors of the economy from search through online retail to social networks and not have a political problem at some point is kind of comical. But naivety was one of the characteristic features of Silicon Valley in the period prior to the election, the naive belief that if everybody was connected, if everybody was on Facebook, then everything would be awesome. <laughs> we, we've been told that ad nauseum since, I don't know, John Perry Barlow's uh, declaration of the independence of cyberspace, the late lamented uh, Barlow. That claim that if we just could all be connected, the world would be would be wonderful wasn't historically a very well-founded claim, nor was it well-founded on the basis of network science. Anybody who really had thought at all seriously about social networks knew that since the 1970s, there had been a, a literature showing that even modestly sized social networks tend to get polarized, tend to self-segregate into different clusters. And, and so it was naive of, of people in Silicon Valley to think that, that wouldn't happen to Facebook and wouldn't happen to Twitter. And, you know, a lot of people in this neck of the woods spent a significant part of the last year or so saying, oh, gee, what have we done? It never occurred to us that this could happen. Oh, my God. Well, it should have occurred to them because it was, I think, historically obvious that trouble was brewing.